It is good to see you. Um, I want you to know I kind of have this scratchy voice today. And it is because Paris has been trying to shut me up for 16 years. <laughs> and it's worked twice since January. I've had this laryngitis. I don't feel bad. I feel fine. It just uh, is this scratchy voice. So, me there's no God. <laughs> <laughs> so excuse me. But I want to make a couple of announcements. And the first is that in the vestibule, you'll see a tree decorated. We do know Christmas is over, but this tree is for our kitchen shower. There are many items that have worn out utensil-wise in our church kitchen, and so we're looking to replace those items. And so if you would be inclined to buy one, take a tag off the tree and uh, purchase it for us. The only thing we ask is that they be a little higher quality, um, a little more maybe than the dollar store, so they last more than a year. Um, so if you can do that, we really would appreciate it. And then today we have a luncheon immediately following worship, and it is a baked potato lunch with all kinds of salads for those of you who are avoiding the carbs of a potato. So you could make a great big salad with all kinds of toppings. So please come join us and uh, enjoy lunch. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I know it's a gray day and it's cold and it's wet and it's yucky, but you're here and we appreciate that. And uh, so it's a, that's right, it's a beautiful gray day. Yeah, Marilyn was just reminding me that this was the kind of day I'd walk in, and, you know, early for the early service, and John Kaufman would be standing there and say, good morning, Paris, what a beautiful, gray, rainy day. And I'd say, shut up, John. <laughs> it's just optimistic to a fault. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, the Mission Grants Committee is seeking your input about uh, an, an emphasis for our mission grants for this year. Uh, we will do hunger, we will do homelessness, uh, but they're looking for a third one. So if you have any ideas, Please uh, let them know. Just scribble out a note and put it in the mission grants box or uh, email uh, Dennis Hewitt or leave it in the office and we'll make sure they get it. Guys, this coming Tuesday, we have our uh, Bob's uh, meeting at uh, Alexander's Restaurant, 8 o'clock. Uh, a, a wonderful place, great food, um, mediocre gr group of guys, and absolutely useless conversation. Uh, so... Uh, it's a great time, so 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning to come out for the Bobs. Also, is uh, immediately after the service, uh, along with the baked potato lunch that Lois was talking about, uh, we also have a reception in the uh, conference room for, um, the, uh, for our Scarlet Knopfs, who's going to be baptized this morning. We invite everybody to come in and, uh, and uh, look at all the beautiful things that are there and uh, join us for that, as well as the baked potato lunch. Uh, if you're a guest in our service today, we want you to know that you're extra special. Let me grab this right here. If you wouldn't mind taking this card out of the pew rack or there's some on the table back at the back of the sanctuary and fill it out, drop it in the offering plate so we can know a little bit more about who you are and uh, be able to stalk you. No, that's not why we're going to do it. Uh, just want to have a record of your visit. Are there other announcements this morning? Oh, okay. Hey, Jean. No, 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 no. There you go. All right, how's this? Oh, you can hear me. Okay, a, a brief update on the um, interim pastor search committee. We were fortunate we had 12 wonderful candidates apply for the position. And we have met and have um, chosen three that we want to continue with. We have interviews set up with each of them over the next three weeks. And we are then contacting their references at the same time. So in about a month, we should know who is coming and what time that person would be available to be here. So just keeping you in the loop. Please continue to pray for a discernment for this. This is important to all of us. Thanks. 
Thank you, Gene. Any other announcements? Then find somebody you haven't spoken to and tell them, hey. You are welcome here, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, on life's journey. You are welcome here, no matter who you are, come and join with us. We're united in the church of Christ. Let's remember that guided by the Holy Spirit, the purpose of First Congregational United Church of Christ in Elgin is to seek God's truth, practice Christ's teachings, and love others unconditionally. God is still speaking. Are you listening? I invite you to stand as you are able. When God speaks, all creation answers. When God speaks, lives are changed. <clears throat> When God speaks, everything is turned inside out. Let us worship the God who speaks to us.
of the day today, and we're doing something that's very different. I'm going to ask you to take a moment, see if you can find a Bible in your pew, or in the pew in front of you. And if you can't find a Bible, grab the hymnal and pretend it's a Bible. And if you can't find that, maybe you have the Bible on your cell phone and you want to use your cell phone. You'll notice there are directions here on what to do with that Bible, and the two girls on either side of me are going to be modeling it as well. So let's begin by holding the Bible open in your palms. Generous God, the Bible is your gift to us. Providing God, your word is daily bread for us. Challenging God, your word is living and active. Comforting God, your word sings out your everlasting love. Guiding God, your word is a light to our path. up everybody we need all the children we are so lucky because today we have a baptism and we're going to have another baptism in a couple weeks for your sister but today our baptism is for Scarlett. And so we're going to welcome Scarlett as one of us. So if you can come this way, so there's room for the baptism, you can come over here, scoot. And Josh, if you'll scoot over here, I think that would be helpful. Great. In baptism, we put on the mantle of Christ, taking his name and becoming one with his body, the church. In this sacrament, we are brought into union with God's ongoing act of salvation, and through water and the Holy Spirit, we are born anew. This is not a solitary act, nor a rite of passage done outside of a relationship to the community of faith. It is an act of community, a moment of solidarity, the beginning of a new reality rooted in the love of God in Christ Jesus. It is a statement of values and ethics, it's a commitment of love, vulnerability, and peace. It's the starting point for a new life rooted in Holy Scripture and informed by tradition, reason, and experience. For the one who comes today, baptism is the mark of her acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of her participation in God's forgiveness, and the beginning of her growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. Sisters and brothers, by the grace of God and in the loving embrace of this community, I call upon Cam and Aaron Knopfs to come forward with their daughter, along with godparents Amber Troyer and Rose Cantu.
And now I ask you parents, do you desire to have your child baptized into the family of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. And all the rest of the questions are addressed to all four of you. Will you teach this child that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, say, we will with God's help. Will you encourage this child to receive the freedom of life in Christ and to renounce those powers which seek to take it away? If so, say, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to show love and justice and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, say, we do with God's help. Do you promise, according to the grace given you, to grow with this child in the Christian faith, to help her along with yourselves to be faithful to the church of Jesus Christ through worship, fellowship, and service so that she may affirm her baptism? If so, say, we do with God's help. We do with God's help. And now, Aaron, if you'll bring Scarlett over here. Boys and girls, I want you to meet Scarlett. Isn't she beautiful? And you know something special about Scarlett? She's wearing the baptismal gown that her mommy wore. And she's wearing the same gown that her sister wore. And her grandma embroidered somewhere along the hem all of their names. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Um, I have some questions to ask all of you. Do you promise to accept? the one who's about to be baptized as your friend? If so, say, we do. Will you play with her and share your toys with her? If so, say, we will. Will you teach her everything you know about Jesus and help her to learn and sing, to sing and pray and to praise God? If so, say, we will with the help of God. And then, will you comfort her when she's sad? Invite her to play when she's lonely and laugh with her when she's happy? If so, say, we will with the help of God. And now I ask all of you in this congregation, will you promise to covenant with these parents to love and care for the one who is about to be baptized as she lives and grows among us. If so, say, we do. Do you promise to offer the nurture of the church so that she may learn to know God and love God and join us on this pilgrimage of faith? If so, say, we do with God's help. <clears throat> Let us pray. Loving God with joy and wonder, we bring to you this little one, confident that you will welcome her as your own true child through the mystery of water and the word. As you enfold her in your arms of love and grace, you make her our sister in Christ. Help her to grow strong and secure here in this fellowship. And then by your Holy Spirit, help us nourish her faith, challenge her mind, and inspire her to serve you with all her heart and mind and soul and strength. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yes. I'm going to invite the godparents to pour the waters of baptism, and you can do it very dramatically. So come and pour. Yeah, just take a hold of it. It's not going to hurt you. You're going to pour it right in there. Hold it high and let it splash. It can be messy. Just make sure it's in the front.
beautifully done, we might have to hire you as professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. By what name will your child be called? Scarlet Rose Sheila Knox. Come here, cute. Scarlet Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father. And Scarlet Rose Sheila, I baptize you in the name of the Son. And I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and sweetie. I seal it with the kiss of God's unending love for you. Brothers and sisters, meet Scarlet Rose Sheila Knopfs. She is now a part of us. She's a part of something much bigger than she is, much bigger than all of us, even bigger than all of us put together. Because the grace of God continues to move through our world and the circle goes on and on. And as I say every time, it's going to be not going to be long before she'll be sitting over here with the children making promises. And then she'll be sitting out there with you making the promises. And the circle of God's grace goes on and on and on and on. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. The words will be on the screen. Also, um, our, uh, one of the uh, godparents is going to play and accompany Gene. So let's sing as we introduce Scarlett to you. to you this rose, which is a symbol of Scarlet's unfolding faith. As it opens, so shall her faith. God bless you all. I'll give this to Dad. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and children, you can go back to your seats if you didn't already, because it's family worship today. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our first reading today is from Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an elvador, but, an in, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the God, on, on the good, and sends rains on the righteous and on the unrighteousness. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. for healing. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. 
When I was six years old, on Christmas, my mother presented me with this Bible. You can see how old it is. It is ancient. If it's good enough for Jesus and the apostles, this was good enough for me. She had a feeling, or a sense, or felt a tremor in the force, however you want to phrase it, that led her to think that someday I would go into ministry. She never mentioned it to me because she didn't want to push me in a direction I wasn't meant to go, but she wanted to do something about this premonition in her heart, and giving me my own copy of the Bible seemed like the right thing to do. Only when I told her years later, when I was a college student, that I was thinking of going into ministry, did she then tell me why she had given me this Bible. Now, I relate that story to you, not so you'll think my mother is a saint, which she is, nor because I want to play on your emotions with one of those, oh, isn't that sweet kind of stories, although it is one of those kind of stories, isn't it? <laughs> but to illustrate for you how long I have been journeying with this book called the Bible. And as I'm doing my exit interview, my last message is here with you, I couldn't help but think I need to talk to you about where I've come from, and what I believe now about the Scriptures. For all the provincialism of my Southern Baptist upbringing, I am grateful for this. I learned to speak Bible. Now by that I don't mean I learned words like thee and thou and the cadences of King James English. I mean I became conversant with the stories and the concepts of Scripture. Southern Baptist Sunday School and worship services familiarized me with the whole sweep of the Bible. We brought our own Bibles with us to church every Sunday. We opened them. We read them. We pondered them in class. Even the adults brought their own Bibles with them to adult Bible school, Sunday school. When the preacher announced the biblical text for the sermon, you could hear pages rustling all over the sanctuary as worshipers opened their own Bibles to follow along as the preacher read. And then when I started preaching, I could always assume at least a rudimentary knowledge of the Bible within the congregation. I could say something like, you know, this passage is not unlike the story of King David and Nathan the prophet. And all my hearers would know what I was talking about. I'll be honest, I miss that. At a deeper level, I worry about the loss of it. A biblically illiterate Christian has nothing to pass on to the next generation except moral concepts, rules, and a vague theology that's planted on a cloud. Why do you think our society has turned so negative about ch the Christian faith in general and the church in particular? It's because we can't speak Bible anymore. And the Franklin Grahams of this world and Tony Perkinses of this world and others breathing hate and exclusion in the name of Jesus have become the only biblical voices that most people hear. The next time some Yahoo on the news claims the LGBT community is all going to hell because the Bible condemns their lifestyle, don't get mad at the Yahoo. If we don't have the ability to speak Bible and present a more Christ-like perspective, we have only ourselves to blame. Louise Pascali once heard an artist ask one of those questions that's not really supposed to have an answer, you know. It's just designed to make you think. And here was the question. Can you stop the birds from singing? Well, Pascali happened to mention that question to her daughter, who is an ornithologist. And she said, well, yes, actually you can stop the birds from singing. If young birds don't hear their own music, if their parents are silenced or disappear, the music is lost. I think about that story every time I remember a conversation I had with a man about why he and his wife were leaving this church. Aside from the fact that I had become too political, 
which means he'd have been okay with it if my politics had resembled his. He went on to say, and you know, you want people all involved in Bible study and things like that, and my wife and I are just not into that. You know, if I'm going to lose somebody from this fellowship, I can't think of a better reason. If I'm going to offend somebody enough to make them leave, let it be because I want us all to speak Bible. If we don't learn to speak Bible, then like the singing of the birds, the music of our faith will be lost forever. But now, learning the language of faith doesn't mean putting our brains in a drawer every time we open a Bible. The writer of 2 Timothy says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But what does it mean to say the Bible is inspired? The Greek word here use, that's used means God breathed or God winded. The Bible is inspired because God was involved in its writing. The Spirit of God, the breath of God was moving through the process. But that still doesn't answer the question, does it? If the Bible's inspired, does that mean it's perfect? Should every fact we know about the world somehow square with the biblical narrative? Some people think so. My brother was in a church recently for a reception, and he wandered into a Sunday school room, and he saw a poster on the wall depicting the animals filing into Noah's Ark. And along with the horses and tigers and birds dutifully marching two by two into the boat, there were also several dinosaurs. You see, in the interpretive assumption of the artist and the church displaying the poster, the Bible must accurately reflect knowledge in every sphere of life or it's not worth the paper it's written on. Such an approach has proved deadly to reasonable people throughout the ages. You probably remember your high school science class where you learned about Galileo running afoul of church teaching when he said his scientific observations indicated the earth revolves around the sun instead of the other way around. And the learned princes of the church said Galileo could not possibly be correct because passages like Psalm 93.1 say the world shall never be moved. Ultimately, Galileo decided it might not be healthy for him to keep saying the earth revolves around the sun, so he formally recanted his opinions. What you may not know, though, is that as he left his trial, it is reported that he muttered under his breath, Epor si muove, which is Italian for, but it still moves. I don't believe the Bible is a science textbook. Because I don't believe inspiration means God dictated the words of the Bible. I believe God's spirit, God's breath was at work in the communities that produced the Bible. Those communities were imperfect and they were reflections of their own time and their history, but God was at work in them as these documents were created and collected. God moved through those communities, speaking in numerous ways to individuals and groups who never had the full truth themselves, but collectively they came to understand what God wants us to know. It's kind of like the old story about the blind men and the elephant. You remember that one? Blind man holding the elephant's tail said the elephant's like a rope. Blind man holding the trunk said the elephant is like a tree branch. The blind man holding the leg said it was like a tree trunk. The blind man holding the ear said an elephant's like a fan. The blind man hold, hold, feeling the elephant's side said it's like a wall. Each one of them was correct. And yet each one of them was incorrect. Only collectively, only together, did the truth emerge. That, to me, is what 2 Timothy means when it says all Scripture is inspired by God. As God moved through those ancient communities, God's truth emerged from the whole, not from its parts. Therefore, I don't have to treat the Bible like an ironing board. I don't have to treat everything in Scripture the same way. And my measuring stick for interpreting a passage is always Jesus. 
If you don't remember anything else I have said in the 16 years that I have been here with you, if you don't remember anything else I've ever said about biblical interpretation, remember this. A Christian always starts with Jesus when interpreting the Bible. A Christian always starts with Jesus when interpreting the Bible. Every passage you study must be placed beside the Jesus we see in the Gospels and the Jesus we know in our hearts. If a passage conflicts with Jesus, then we study it, we try to understand it, but we do not take it as the last word on how we live as disciples. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't say, follow every word in the Bible. There's a tongue-in-cheek letter some of you may have seen it, crops up on the internet every now and then, purports to be a letter from a Bible-believing person addressed to some high-profile evangelical like Tony Perkins or Franklin Graham, or sometimes it's to a celebrity like Dr. Laura. It's the same content. And it purports to be this Christian asking questions about how to apply certain biblical passages to life. Here are a few selections. I would like to sell my daughter into slavery as sanctioned in Exodus 21.7. In this day and age, what do you think would be a fair price for her? How about this? I know that I am allowed no contact with a woman while she is on her period of menstrual uncleanness, Leviticus 15, 19 through 24. The problem is, how do I tell? I have tried asking, but most women take offense. There's this one, Leviticus 25.44 states that I may indeed possess slaves, both male and female, provided they are purchased from neighboring nations. A friend of mine claims this applies to Mexicans, but not Canadians. Can you clarify, why can't I own Canadians? I love this one. My uncle has a farm. He violates Leviticus 19.19 by planting two different crops in the same field, as does his wife by wearing garments made of two different kinds of thread cotton and polyester blend. He also tends to curse and blaspheme a lot. Is it really necessary that we go to all the trouble of getting the whole town together to stone them? Leviticus 24, 10 through 16. Couldn't we just burn them to death at a private family affair like we do with people who sleep with their in-laws? Leviticus 20, 14. And then this. A friend of mine feels that even though eating shellfish is an abomination, Leviticus 11:10. It is a lesser abomination than homosexuality. I don't agree. Can you settle this? Are there degrees of abomination? Now that's what happens when you treat Scripture all the same. Jesus didn't do that. Today's reading from Matthew 5 shows his unfolding, changing view of the Bible. Over and over again, he says, you have heard that it was said, and then he quotes from the Bible. But then he has the audacity to say, but I say to you. In other words, the final word is not the Bible. The final word is Jesus. He is our authority. When anything in the Bible conflicts with life and the, with the life and the message of Jesus, we don't ignore it, but we don't take it as normative either. Jesus is always the standard for us. How many of you know the children's song, the B-I-B-L-E? Sing it with me. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Cute song. Bad theology. We don't stand alone on the Word that is the Bible. We stand alone on the Word that is Jesus. His life, His teachings, His message of love, hope, and inclusion is where we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. For many years, the world-renowned conductor Arturo Toscanini led the NBC Symphony Orchestra on a weekly radio program. It featured magnificent symphonies, operas, works by classic and contemporary composers, most of which were conducted by Toscanini himself. The performances were broadcast live all over the country. Well, one day in the mail, Toscanini received a crumpled note scrawled on a brownish piece of paper that read, Dear Mr. Toscanini, 
I am a lonely sheep herder in the mountains of Wyoming. I have two prized possessions, an old violin and a battery-operated radio. The batteries in the radio are getting weak and beginning to run down, and my violin is so out of tune, I can't play it anymore. Would you please sound the note of A next Saturday on your program so I can tune my violin and play it when I, when I can't listen to the radio anymore? Pretty nervy, ain't it? Asking one of the premier conductors of his day to get one of the finest orchestras in the country to play an A note just so nobody herding sheep in the mountain of Wyoming could tune his old violin. And yet the following week, after Toscanini took the stage, he announced, for my newfound friend in the mountains of Wyoming, the NBC Symphony Orchestra is now all together in unison going to sound a perfect A. And with that, some of the finest musicians in the world played one note. They played an A. And from that one note, a lonely little man was able to tune the A string on his violin. And from that string, he could tune the E string. And then he could tune the D string. And then he could tune the G string. That one note opened up the whole world of music for him. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is the note of hope that opens up the whole world of the Bible for us. Listen to him. You'll get the rest of the strings in tune. As we ponder those words, I invite you into a time of silent prayer and reflection.
join me in the prayer of dedication. <clears throat> As children of God, we seek to live lives that are pleasing to you, O God. And to this we dedicate our lives. As Easter people, we offer our gifts and ourselves. Take all that we have and use it to proclaim your message of grace in new life. To Christ be we pray. Would you take the hand of your neighbor, please? This week, learn to speak Bible, but make sure your tutor is Jesus. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.